Finally, we come to the fourth type of biological molecules, nucleic acids. Nucleic acids encode the instructions for how to make proteins, among other things. Nucleic acids come in two types, deoxyribonucleic acids, or DNA, and ribonucleic acids, or RNA. DNA is the way information is encoded to direct cellular function so that new cells act just like old cells. DNA also makes a copy of itself in a similar but different molecule called messenger RNA, which controls the primary structure of polypeptides. Protein synthesis occurs at organelles called ribosomes in the cell. In the eukaryotes, you do remember who the eukaryotes are, don't you? You should. Wink. DNA is contained in the nucleus of the cells, different from an atomic nucleus, of course, and messenger RNA is made by copying from the DNA. The messenger RNA, or mRNA, leaves the nucleus and goes into the cytoplasm, which is the main room of the cell. In the cytoplasm, ribosomes, this hamburger bun looking thing down here, uh, attaches to the messenger RNA and starts producing a polypeptide from amino acids. This idea of DNA making RNA and RNA making protein is called the central dogma of molecular biology. And we'll come back to this with some detail in unit three. Let's look at the parts of nucleic acids. They are polymeric, like carbohydrates and proteins, and the polymers are called polynucleotides. The monomers are called nucleotides. The nucleotides have three parts, like amino acids had certain consistent parts. There's a nitrogenous base, a five-carbon sugar, or a pentose, and at least one phosphate group. If there's no phosphate groups, which sometimes happens, what you've got is a nucleoside rather than a nucleotide. Let's look at the three parts of a nucleotide. The orange hexagon here represents a nitrogenous base. This may have one or two rings and always contains nitrogen. The green part down here may remind you of glucose because it's green and almost a hexagon. However, this is a pentagon, and it is a 5-carbon sugar, or pentose. Notice how the numbers on the pentose are, have prime symbols next to them. So here's one prime, here's three prime, there's five prime. The third part is the phosphate group, which is just like the functional group that we saw in chapter 4. To remember the functions of the three parts of a nucleotide, I will invoke the Starship Enterprise model. It helps if you are familiar with the Starship Enterprise. It looks like this, and it is also made up of three parts. The command module, over here on the right, the engineering section, down here in the middle, and the warp engines. The command module is where the captain sits and all of the big decisions are made. This is the most variable part of the nucleotide and the part that directs the message that is encoded. The engineering section basically makes sure the ship is running smoothly and holds together. The five carbon sugar essentially does the same thing, holds everything together. The engines make everything go, and phosphate groups, we will see, are a great energy source, though in nucleic acids that energy is channeled into forming bonds with the next nucleotide. Now that you see it, may you never unsee it. Let's get into what these things really do. A polynucleotide is strung together by what's called a sugar phosphate backbone, because the pentoses and phosphate groups alternate to form a consistent chain, akin to what we saw the amino groups and carboxyl groups did in polypeptides. Note how the five carbon sugars are all pointing in the same direction. These oxygen O's are pointing up. Also note how the nitrogenous base orange shapes are not all the same. In unit three, we will see in some detail how polynucleotides are made. One more thing for us to know now is that the connections between the sugars and the phosphates are called phosphodiester linkages. 
So now all four macromolecules have named linkages for us to remember. This reflects how the molecule can contain information which can be read. There are differences in the sequence of the nitrogenous bases, like different letters in the alphabet, but there must also be consistency in the sugar phosphate backbone to allow the other molecules to read them, kind of like grammar and spelling rules. The variability in components for nucleic acids is not as deep as the 20 different R groups in amino acids. There are only five nitrogenous bases divided into two groups. Each nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, has only four nitrogenous bases and one type of five carbon sugar. Pyrimidines are one ring nitrogenous bases and they are cytosine, represented just as C here, thymine, which is T, and in RNA, thymine is replaced with uracil, or U. The purines have just two different types. They are adenine, A, and guanine, G. How do you remember this? I have some mnemonics for you. Pyrimidines are a big word for a small molecule. So pyrimidines means one ring, big word, small molecule. And purines, the opposite is true. Small word for big molecule. Small word, two rings. How do I remember which ones are the pyrimidines? I remember that the ancient Egyptians built pyramids and worshipped cats. CT. Or if the presence of the A in cat is confusing to you, you can remember that T and U are interchangeable. Or you can think of the pyramid on the dollar bill and how it is cut off at the top. C-U-T. For the purines, I think of how Purina is a company that makes agricultural products. A and G is ag. So hopefully we have the nitrogenous bases all sorted out, and that leaves us with the sugars, a.k.a. the pentoses. Already knowing something about sugars is coming in handy. Both of these sugars are in the ring form, and we can see they have plenty of hydroxyl groups. Ribose, on the right, is the sugar that we find in RNA. The nitrogenous base is attached to the one prime carbon through the hydroxyl group, and the phosphate groups link to the five prime and the three prime carbons. Take a look at the two prime carbon, though, and note that the pink rectangle is on the hydroxyl group here. Now look at deoxyribose, and you'll observe that everything is the same except the two prime carbon has just a hydrogen and no hydroxyl. It's been deoxygenated. Just there. That's it. That's all the difference in these two molecules. No big deal, right? Except in what happens when you string a few hundred or a thousand or billion of them together in a polynucleotide. We have seen two structural differences between DNA and RNA so far. What are they? Different sugars, deoxyribose versus ribose, and different nitrogenous bases, ACGT in DNA and ACGU in RNA. Here's one more, and it's a doozy. As a polynucleotide, DNA forms a double-stranded helical molecule. There are, there are two polynucleotides running anti-parallel to each other or in opposite directions. Just like a road has lanes that run anti-parallel. One lane goes north and the other goes south. The two strands of DNA complement each other, and that doesn't just mean they say nice things to each other, in that the nitrogenous bases will hydrogen bond to each other or base pair with each other according to certain rules. A will always bind to T, and G will always bind to C. This means the usual condition for DNA is as a double-stranded helix, and it is beautiful, and we will talk more about it in Unit 3. RNA is a single-stranded molecule that sometimes will base pair within that single strand, A with U and C with G, to produce a molecule like transfer RNA over here on the right, which maybe isn't as aesthetic as DNA, 
okay, it kind of looks like a duct tape disaster. But it has a beauty in its functionality that we literally just can't live without. This brings us to the end of chapter 5, so now all of the learning objectives once again. And here we are at the end of this part of the chapter, and this chapter, and the end of Unit 1. So coming up next, we have the end boss of this unit, which is Exam 1. Ooh, that makes it look scary. Maybe it won't be quite like this. Maybe more like this. Well, you probably won't find it's going to be that easy, so... There we go. Perfect. Perfect.